So coroutines kind of like became everywhere suddenly last fall on Android, uh, which kind of like leads to this very important question, are coroutines bad? So I'm kind of a pragmatic programmer. Um, I, I kind of like don't always jump on the new thing when it comes out. Uh, one, one sign of this is uh, in this room right now, who here has talked about coroutines on Android in the last six months? So I'm seeing like 80% of you, uh, and I believe the other 20% of you have talked about it, so you just didn't raise your hand. Uh, so then, the other question I have is, who here was talking about coroutines on Android two and a half years ago? One person. I'll chat after, by the way. I'd love to know why. Uh, so yeah, that's actually like, that's kind of like a bit of a, a warning sign for like a technology. It kind of like came out of nowhere. Uh, it blew up. Everyone's talking about it. Uh, and we, you know, maybe it's not going to solve a problem. Maybe it's going to be something where we're all going to talk about in two years, and then we're just going to like pretend it didn't happen. And we're going to move on and go on to the new thing that shows up in two years. So one of the things that I think I really want to like dive into is what problems are coroutines trying to solve? Like what problems can we solve very, very well with coroutines that we maybe can't solve as well with other uh, solutions that we have? Coroutines basically solve one problem extremely well. They simplify async programming by replacing the call path. So this is the, like, the key thing that a coroutine will give you. Uh, there's kind of a lot going on here. So I have this like concept of async programming, which is like, Maybe a little nebulous. Um, and replacing callbacks, maybe that's a little bit more clear. But let's let's dive in and see what that actually means. Uh, so here I have uh, just kind of an imaginary network request function, um, and this one is written in what's called a blocking style. Uh, so it's going to go ahead and call the network request in a very dark purple that you can hardly see in this lighting. Uh, but it's calling network request and it's getting the result right away, uh, and it's going to go ahead and pass that. And this is called a blocking style because that result goes directly from the function call. So when this runs, it's going to go ahead and call that request. And I'm going to actually run this on the main thread just for fun uh, because it makes things way more interesting when we do that. Um, also, that's where user events tend to start. So we're going to call this on the main thread. And then during the entire duration of that network request, the main thread is going to be blocked. And if it wants to do something like refresh the screen or handle a user touch, it can't do that. The user is going to see your app as frozen. Uh, kind of like not responding. Uh, this is not really a great experience on Android. Um, I kind of want to pause for a second and say there's nothing particularly wrong with blocking network request style programming. Uh, lots of backend developers do do this, uh, but on Android, this isn't what we want to do. So to solve that, we can introduce async programming. So async programming, the, like the form that we usually see, is to introduce a callback, right? So here I'm saying I have a function load data, and when I call network request, still from the main thread, I'm going to pass a callback to the network library. Um, I'm not going to get the result right away as a result of that function call. So when I call this, now when I call network request, still on the main thread, the main thread's actually going to get unblocked right away uh, because it doesn't need to sit there waiting for that result. The network library is going to go find another thread, and it's going to run that network request for me, and it's going to use that callback as kind of a handle that it can use to call back into my code. And then in that callback, I can go ahead and show the result. So this is the core concept of async programming. And callbacks are one way we can accomplish this. If I rewrite that exact same code, so we can do the same thing three times, this time I'm going to do async programming with coroutines. So if you've never seen a coroutine before, you'll notice this looks exactly like the first slide. This code gets the result immediately from calling network request and can assign it to data. Uh, this is quite suspicious. It, it looks like it's going to block the main thread. And my assertion is this is actually not going to block the main thread. So what happens when we call this? So we're still going to call it, and it's going to be called from the main thread. And it's going to get unblocked, and all of the undraws are going to be able to happen. The networking library is still responsible for finding a network thread. And this is a key concept to understanding coroutines on Android. There's still another thread going on. But when it wants to pass the result back, instead of using a callback as a handle into my code, it's just going to go ahead and resume the coroutine, and I'm going to be able to show that result to the user. So this is the core concept of coroutines right here. We have this concept at the top where we suspend. Uh, we had a coroutine that was running. We suspended it on the main thread. And then later, when the result was ready, we resume that coroutine. So one way to think about this is suspend and resume kind of creates a callback 
from the rest of my function. Uh, so when I call that network request, because it's a suspend function, it's going to make a callback out of everything left in my function. It's going to capture all the local variables while it does that. So you can think about suspend and resume with coroutines as a direct replacement for callbacks. And in fact, we can even write that. Uh, so here I have the callback version, or the coroutine version. I can write that as the callback version. And these execute pretty much the same way. There's a, a couple differences. Uh, but the core concept is the same, right? These codes do the same thing. So I'm going to switch that back to coroutines. And let's dive into this network request function that we've been calling. So it's also going to be a suspend function. And that's Kotlin's way of telling uh, a function that it needs to work with coroutines. Uh, and because it's a suspend function, it can call with context dispatchers.io. And so here's kind of where this magic that allows this main safety to happen happens. So dispatchers.io is one of three dispatchers that Kotlin gives us. Uh, so we have the main dispatcher, the IO dispatcher, and then the default dispatcher. And these are all used for different things. So the main dispatcher is the main thread on Android. And it's where you pretty much put everything that doesn't belong in one of these other dispatchers. The IO dispatcher is optimized for doing network and disk based oper operations. So here we're going to make a network request, so we're going to want to use the IO dispatcher. And then the default dispatcher uh, is for doing things that are CPU bound, uh, maybe transforming a list uh, and doing a couple thousand allocations. That's the sort of thing you'd want to put on the default dispatcher. Um, so a little bit of confusing terminology. Uh, so everything goes on the main dispatcher, but the CPU dispatcher is called the default dispatcher. Uh, what's going on there? Uh, so it turns out um, coroutines are also designed for backend programming in Kotlin. And when you're writing backend code, the default dispatcher is a totally reasonable default. But on Android, typically we start in the main thread, and we want to kind of stay in the main thread unless we're doing something special. So now that we have these dispatchers that are where coroutines can run, we can switch between them. So network request here says, I want to go ahead and run the rest of this block on the IO dispatcher. So in there, it's totally safe to make blocking calls and then block a thread because we've allocated a thread other than the main thread to run this code. And this is one of the key concepts of coroutines. We get this like really precise main safety without introducing callbacks or introducing any sort of complexity to our API service. We can just go ahead and call network requests from any thread, and it's going to be safe even if that thread is the main thread. Now, of course, typing with context everywhere in our code base, if we had to write this every time we made a network request or every time we made a database operation, uh, that would actually be quite tedious. Like, this, this line of code is, it's kind of short on a slide, but if you imagine a couple thousand of these in a repository, uh, it's just really going to blow up your code pretty quickly. So it turns out that with context is definitely something that fits really, really well into libraries. Uh, so you can, you know, is it out yet? OK, in a version of retrofit that's coming out shortly, uh, you can go ahead and make a suspend function in your retrofit interface. So you can go ahead and say, my network request here is a suspend function. And then retrofit will go ahead and do that thread refinement, that main safety for you. And then your call can look just like a regular function call. It'll rely on the suspend and resume mechanism in order to make everything work correctly. And this is really cool, because now we get main safety without having to introduce callbacks into our call. This is one of the key concepts that you really kind of have to get as you like move into using coroutines on Android, uh, that good suspend functions, well-written suspend functions, are always main safe. They should always be able to be called on the main thread. So if you do excessive CPU, um, you transform a thousand elements in a list to another thousand elements, uh, you should go ahead and switch over to the default dispatcher. If you make a network request or if you make a, a disk I.O., you should switch over to another dispatcher and make sure that that function can be called from the main. So that gives us the two things that coroutines are really good at solving. They replace callbacks, and they give us main safety on Android. So for the rest of this talk, uh, I want to kind of like move through from the past of coroutines and get to the present. And in, in that journey, I want to kind of like look at this question of are coroutines bad? Are they something that like is just going to like be a flash in the pan? Or are they going to solve a real problem that we can expect to uh, be able to get actual solutions out of? So the idea of coroutines is actually really, really, really old. Uh, they come from 1963. Uh, so the idea of coroutines uh, was first invented while writing the COBOL compiler, which is one of the very first program, like human programming languages ever made. Uh, so there's a paper by Conway when they were writing the COBOL compiler that 
uh, kind of walks through what they invented. So the idea is uh, they were making this uh, the first compiler, and they did they had like literally less RAM than I have fingers. Uh, so they wanted to like load literally as little as possible each step of the compiler. So they kind of set up this uh, kind of streaming style interface, and they used this idea of suspending and resuming coroutines between the steps in order to make that work. And I, I really kind of want to like mention uh, this was not a feature of COBOL. This is all implemented in assembly. Uh, COBOL didn't have any features. <laughs> so the paper says coroutines are a function which communicates with other functions for both input and output. Uh, so if you understood this definition, uh, raise your hand. Uh, okay, I didn't either. Um, it turns out actually no one really got this definition. Uh, and we kind of flailed around for about seven years with a bunch of different implementations. So uh, I think I'll give Conway credit for inventing the term coroutines because that stuck around. We still use that in 2019. Uh, but I'm not sure he gets full credit for inventing the concept. So if we move forward from COBOL, uh, the first programming language implementation of coroutines happened in 1967 in a language called Simula. Uh, Simula is this like gem of a language uh, that I found when I was researching for this talk. Uh, so it came out in 1967, uh, which is before the first moon landing. Uh, and it has object-oriented programming. It has inheritance. It has methods. It has properties. Uh, it has like tons of things that we take for granted in programming languages today. Like way, way, way long ago, at the very beginning of programming languages. Uh, what it doesn't have is functions of really any kind. It doesn't have call stacks. It only has coroutines. So, uh, well, uh, so I do want to mention that while this is before the first moon landing, I don't believe, to the best of my knowledge, coroutines have ever been to the moon. So, you like them. So we take a look at some Simula code. It's commonly written on a small pile of punch cards, uh, which we can translate to some text. So Simula code looks something like this, right? So it has classes, it has objects, just like we're used to. So I'm going to make a class ping and a class pong, and I'm going to try to pass control back between these two things. And let's go ahead and write some Simula code. Uh, full disclaimer, I couldn't find a working Simula compiler in 2018, so this code only exists on slides. Uh, but uh, what I'm going to do is make a reference to pong from ping and a reference to ping from pong. And these are just reference variables like you might declare in pong. Then I'm going to call detach. And this is kind of a magical thing. So when pong is running, when detach gets called, it's going to go ahead and suspend the execution of pong and pass control back to whoever called pong. It's going to do that same thing over in ping. And then the caller is going to be responsible for setting up these references and then resuming both of these. And when it gets resumed, uh, it's just going to go ahead and pass control between these two. And the really important point here, I'm not trying to like, convince you to use Simula. Um, it's, it's a very fascinating language. It has semicolons, which I get the bore. But in 1967, we have the core ideas that we would later see in 2019 already stable in coroutines. So we have suspend, which maps over to detach, and resume, which maps over to resume. Uh, so this is pretty cool. Resume actually made it all the way through time, and we still call it resume. So we go up to the next language that's kind of interesting in the journey of coroutines. So Simula is like the first implementation of coroutines. Uh, ACL is this really interesting academic language that Milner wrote as his PhD thesis. Uh, and as far as I thought, uh, no one had ever used except Milner when he was writing his PhD thesis until one of my coworkers at Google told me he had an internship where he actually used this language. So I guess two people have used this language in the history of its existence. Uh, so Milner gives us uh, this operational definition of coroutines. And this is uh, 1980. This is when we finally like, kind of solve coroutines. And this is going to be the definition that kind of carries forward and we now use for coroutines. Uh, so it defines a coroutine as something where local data persists between successive calls. And execution is suspended and resumed where it left off. So we have kind of this core concept uh, already solved in 1980. Uh, if you keep going, the first 20 pages of his PhD thesis are really, really brilliant, and I totally recommend reading it if you want to read historical coroutines in 1980. Uh, then it gets kind of weird. Uh, so then he starts solving all sorts of 1980s problems with uh, coroutines. Uh, this one is called the structure of the solution to the telegram problem, which raises so many questions. Uh, what is the telegram problem? Uh, why is someone sending telegrams in 1980? And who codes like that? That looks very, very complicated. Uh, so as a result, like this, this really didn't catch on. Like in the '80s, we didn't really see a, a, everyone start using coroutines. And we fast forward, and we see a couple more academic languages have coroutines, but they kind of have fizzled out because they're a solved problem academically. 
uh, we get Lua, which does have coroutines and has some success. And then all of a sudden, in the year 2000, Perl gets coroutines. So everything before here, we're kind of looking at academia. This is a very, very pragmatic language. Uh, it may not seem like that big of a deal today, but in 2000, if you were writing a back-end server, your choices were really Perl, C++, or maybe the Java programming language. Uh, this is big, right? This is year 2000, the internet's happening. So everyone's writing backends, and Perl's very, very popular. And Perl introduces coroutines, is a coroutine, uh, in a coroutine, a value is returned by suspending and later resuming, uh, which is still kind of abstract. And honestly, like, if you go look at actual Perl usage, uh, coroutines weren't that popular in Perl. Uh, then the next language that gets coroutines is Python in 2005. So this one actually turns out to be really, really good. Uh, so this is, uh, Python is starting to become very popular for back-end programming around uh, 2005, uh, and that's like right when it hit its takeoff and people started using Python substantially. If you go find the tech, you'll see that they say coroutines are a natural way of expressing asynchronous I.O. Um, and now we're finally getting down to the core problem that coroutines are really, really good at solving, and that we've seen again and again languages have adopted, and lots of developers have found success with coroutines is doing this. <clears throat> now, they also listed a bunch of other things you can do with coroutines, like uh, writing a compiler. Uh, as far as I'm aware, literally no one has ever actually done in Python. Uh, but this one actually took off, and lots and lots of people did do this. So let's go back to that example from the beginning. So we have this system function that loads some data and shows it to the user, and let's translate it to Python. So if you've never seen Python before, there's a couple differences. Uh, they spell the word fun death, which I know, it's fine. Uh, they use colons in Python instead of curly brackets, which is a choice. Uh, there is no closing curly bracket. And a uh, really, really, really important point in your Python code, uh, those are spaces and not text. The other thing that's going on here is there's this yield keyword uh, that we see in Python, and in fact, actually, most languages that have coroutines. And this is one of the big things that Kotlin added and moved the, the state of the other coroutines forward. So every time I call something like network request, where I want that suspend and resume behavior in Python, I have to go ahead and say yield. And if I forget to say yield, I get a completely different thing, and it doesn't suspend and resume. And it's actually really easy to do this, and everyone forgets it, and it's a bug all the time. Uh, so Kotlin is like, OK, if this is the default. This is how we're going to do uh, async I.O. Let's go ahead and just get rid of that decoration and add it to the function instead. Uh, so I want to use this Python example to walk through how a dispatch and due to this podium, I will read this code as I go. Uh, so the way a dispatcher works in, in Python is kind of interesting because it's also, it's where these ideas come from that Colin uh, later implemented. And the implementations in Python are a little bit simpler to understand than the implementation in Colin. So a dispatcher is basically trying to run a code routine to do some sort of, uh, some sort of operation and, and maybe resume it in the future. So in order to make a dispatcher, I'm going to go ahead and call load data. And you might expect, uh, because uh, I just called the function, that something's going to happen when I do this. Um, but it turns out, actually, because I have that yield keyword, uh, I don't actually call the function in Python right away. Instead, I make this generator thing, which is kind of like an iterator. It's something I can go ahead and call next time. Then I can go ahead and put that into a for loop. So I'm going to go for something in generator. Uh, and that's going to actually run this load data request. So now I'm uploading the data. And it's going to go ahead and run, start the network request, and then yield it out. So this is kind of that suspend and resume mechanism right here. It's explicit in Python. So when network request uh, yields, it's going to go back down into my dispatcher. Uh, and it's going to pass that result into my quote. And I'm going to be able to go ahead and call, uh, I'm going to call that suspend call. That's not a real name. No one in Python or Kotlin calls these things suspend calls, but I have to call it something. Um, the idea is it's an uh, object that represents a network request that's ongoing. And then I'm going to go ahead and process that and like register a callback or some other mechanism to get a result from it. And then I'm going to go ahead and send the result by saying generator send. And I'm going to pass the result back up to load data. And that's going to pass it uh, through. Right? So that actually resumes load data. And the result is available immediately to the yield expression. Um, so this is a whole bunch of Python, uh, which is probably not what you expected coming to an Android conference. But there it is. So after Python, uh, we get Go in 2007, which is quite famous for, for coroutines. They have these, they call them Go routines, um, and it's, it's very effectively at, uh, very effective at making high-performance backend systems. Uh, but then the really big one 
was C++ oh, and C Sharp. Uh, C Sharp especially was huge. It came out in 2012. Um, and if you were doing coroutines at the time, uh, they were kind of this fun thing we were playing around with in Python, and then like Go came out and some like cool kids were using it on Hacker News. Um, and that was like the extent of coroutines usage. C Sharp is the main programming language for Windows that Microsoft has you know, millions of developers using this language, and they added it as a core feature to C Sharp. And that really like transitioned coroutines from being this kind of like fun thing we were playing around with and trying to figure out if they were cool to, oh wow, this thing's mainstream all of a sudden. Uh, going forward, 2017, JavaScript finally gets their coroutines stabilized. They've been in the works for a couple of years now. Um, and then 2018, Kotlin and Swift get coroutines. Um, so if you look at this overall timeline right here, uh, there's like a very, very clear trend. Uh, at the very beginning, uh, it's, you know, we solve coroutines in programming languages very early, um, and then no one really uses them for quite a long time. And then all of a sudden, in the year 2000, tons and tons and tons of mainstream practical programming languages that people use every day get coroutines. And the question is, what happened? Like, why did C not have coroutines back in here? And the answer is, is really quite clear. Uh, the web happened, and we all have to solve network programming part of our day jobs nowadays. Uh, who here had to make a network request from a program in the last six months? So that's everyone. Uh, and if you imagine if I asked that same question in 1980, I would get a very different answer. Um, so this is now very normal programming. We need very normal solutions to this problem. And the solution is that coroutines are a natural way of expressing asynchronous IO. <clears throat> So that takes us through the past. We like got up to the present now. And let's take a look at where Kotlin has advanced things. So we've already seen that Kotlin got rid of that yield expression, that yield keyword, and moved it to suspend where we decorate the function instead. Uh, there's a couple like other things going on in the present. Um, one of the big ones, and this is actually I think really huge, especially as like an Android developer considering coroutines, is that coroutines are rarely taught in school or online in introductory programming. Uh, so, I kind of have a, like a, a series of questions that everyone asked. Uh, so, who here knows how functions work and learns how fun learned how functions work when they're learning how to program? Is that, is that everyone? Does anyone not know how functions work? It's okay, I can I can teach you after. Um, okay. So, okay. So, functions are pretty well understood. Um, so, then another level in this is like who could explain how to how functions work using call stacks? Maybe if they had an interview question from an interviewer. So that's uh, I'd say about forty percent of you felt comfortable with that one. Uh, then the last question is, uh, who here at some point in their life has implemented a function call, uh, like implemented functions in an interpreter or a compiler, maybe in an academic course? So that's 10% of you here. Okay. So it's still, it's kind of rare, but like some people have done it in this room, random Android developers I just pulled. Uh, so the next question I have is, uh, who here could explain how coroutines work at kind of the same level they can explain how functions work? Uh, Jake Wood. <laughs> uh, that was expected, actually. I was going to be disappointed if you kept your hand up. <laughs> so, in order to do that, let's go ahead and do like a really, really. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. I added a section here to motivate. So earlier, I explained that coroutines work by making a callback from the rest of your function, which is a really good like kind of semantic mapping definition. It like lets you take the concept you understand from your callbacks and like translate it. Into um, but it doesn't really help me if I wanted to implement coroutines. It's like it's not it's not enough to actually understand how they work. Uh, so I'd like to, for a brief moment, do a little missing CS1 lecture that we I think we all should have attended, but we didn't. Welcome to class. <laughs> As a reminder, I'm currently taking a sabbatical from email, and I will not be replying to emails until the fall semester. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about coroutines. Uh, coroutines offer an alternative flow control implementation uh, to functions. Uh, and as you clearly saw in the previous slide. <laughs> Alright, so let's do that as a conference talk instead. Um, so let's review really quickly how call stacks work. So I have this main thread down here, and it has a stack. And I'm going to go ahead and make a, a hello Chicago function. Um, I'm going to, it's hello, it takes a parameter, and I'm going to pass it Chicago. So when I call this function, it's going to go ahead and pass that parameter in, and it adds a stack frame to the call stack. That's what this, this box right here is. It's a stack frame. It represents uh, all of the functions that are in, in this call stack. Uh, and it keeps track of the parameter in that stack frame right there. Then it's going to go ahead and try to do this append thing, because I'm using uh, one of these 
fancy dollar sign things in Kotlin. Uh, so that actually uses a string builder and it actually ends up calling a function called append to do that. Um, so it's going to push another stack frame onto the call stack, uh, and it's going to put the parameter string of Chicago into that stack frame as well. Uh, then that returns, and I get my string back. Uh, and then it's going to go ahead and call print line. Uh, that oh, went too fast, sorry. That adds another stack frame, print line, which has the obvious parameter name of X. Uh, I did not name that. That's the actual parameter in the source code. Uh, so that's going to go ahead and run. That actually causes some code, some output to be printed onto the screen. Then that pops off. Then hello pops off, and now my program is done. All right. So this is what happens when you call a function, just a regular function. So now let's like flip the script a little bit and let's go back to coroutines and see what happens at that exact same level of abstraction when we implement coroutines. So in order to call load data, um, I'm still going to do this on the main thread. Um, so I have a main thread stack over here, which for this part of the room I will describe with words. Uh, so it's, a, uh, so it's a, a main thread stack that's just like before. And I'm also going to modify my function just for fun. I'm going to assign a local variable x to 1 just because CS1 I'm not sure that's what we do. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and call this. And in order to call a suspend function um, in any programming language, uh, you have to kind of keep track of where you started doing coroutines on the call stack and where you were doing regular functions. Um, and I'm going to call this thing a suspend marker. And it's this little green bar that I'm putting on the call stack right here. And you'll see why this is important in just a second. Then I'm going to call load data. And when I call load data, that's going to go ahead and it's just going to push a stack frame onto the call stack just like normal. Uh, then I'm going to assign x equal to 1, and so now my stack frame gets updated, and x is equal to 1, and that's stored in the stack frame. And now I want to call network request. And now I have to implement that suspended reason. So in order to do that, what I do is I copy that stack frame. Uh, I just literally move that stack frame off of the stack and over into kind of this unstructured area where I keep all of my suspended coroutines. Um, that's probably going to be actually then I'm going to go ahead and call network request, and that calls just like a regular function as well. It's going to put a stack frame onto the stack, and then that resume, or suspends as well in order to actually do the, uh, the with context dispatchers.io. So now at this point, every single coroutine that was executing on the main thread has been suspended. They've all been moved off of the main thread stack. So I can remove that suspend marker, and then we can move through time. And we can see that the network request actually runs on dispatchers.io. And then when the network request is done, it's going to go ahead and start resuming these coroutines. So first, it's going to take network request and move it back onto the call stack. All right, so it's just going to take it what it suspended earlier, and it's going to move it back on. <clears throat> then it's going to process it, maybe it's going to parse the JSON, and pass the result back to me. Then next, it's going to go ahead and resume load data. So now. The stack frame comes back over. Note that local variable x is still set to 1, and data is available as well. So I can assign data and go ahead and show the result. And so that's the mechanism right there. That's how you can implement coroutines by literally taking and freezing the state of the current function and kind of moving it over and then resuming it later. And that's a way you like, can think about how to implement, make the rest of the function into a column. So when we look at today, the other thing that's going on is structured concurrency. Uh, this is a new concept right around the introduction of column coroutines. Uh, so it actually comes from Python. Uh, it was implemented in a library uh, in Python. It was called Gardens over there. Uh, but Kotlin introduced it with Kotlin Linux coroutines 1.0. Now, one thing is, is coroutines, uh, as I showed earlier, coroutines are a solved problem from 40 years ago. Structured concurrency is from right there on this timeline. Uh, so it, it kind of showed up about like last year. Uh, so while I'm pretty comfortable with how coroutines work, structured concurrency is kind of new, um, and I think we're still figuring out both how to explain it, how to understand it, and what the implications of structured concurrency are. But let's let's take a dive. I'm going to like try to explain structured concurrency today, and you can let me know whether it works or not. Uh, so structured concurrency is a, kind of a whole design pattern system in coroutines to help solve the problem of leaks. Um, and this is a pretty big deal with coroutines. And this is actually like a real problem. So having done backend systems with coroutines, I can say you do, in fact, leak work, and you have to come up with systems to deal with this and eventually clean up those tasks. Uh, so when you think about it, when I was copying those stack frames earlier, just, I showed moving two of those over and suspending two different coroutines. Uh, you can have very large numbers of those, um, numbers like a million. Um, so it's really easy to keep track of two things. Um, it's very, very hard to keep track of a million things. 
Uh, and so it's like very easy to just accidentally have a coroutine that you suspended just kind of hanging out there somewhere, and you have no idea what it's doing anymore. Um, and this is like a little bit worse than a memory leak in some ways. Um, so memory leak, you're using, you're using one of the resources uh, that you have available on your computer. But with a coroutine leak, you actually use memory as well as potentially CPU, because it might resume itself every now and then and actually do some work. It might use some network, it might use some disk. Like this thing can actually use up a lot of resources from your, for your program. So in order to solve this, coroutine kind of, uh, Kotlin coroutines introduces this idea of structured concurrency, and it takes this fairly simple statement. When a function returns, it has completed all work. Uh, is there anyone who disagrees with, with this, hopefully, I hope, non-controversial statement? All right, so everyone's on board with when a function is done, it's, it's, it's done. So Colin has improved this and added, when a suspend function returns, it has completed all work. And this is the core concept of structured concurrency. So in order to do this, uh, Colin had to make a couple changes to the way you interact with code results. So in order to actually call load data, so this is a suspend function, um, you can't just call this from a regular uh, now, you might be thinking, uh, uh, you know, this is a coroutine, why can't I just do, deal with it right away? Uh, you actually, what you need to do in order to call the suspend function is you need to create a coroutine. Uh, and kind of like, like skip over this so far in this talk. But in order to do that, you can call one of the builders. Um, if you did try to call it normally, it would say suspend fun load data must be called from a coroutine. In order to actually call it, you can call one of the builders like launch. Uh, the Kotlin provides in order the launch goes ahead and makes a new coroutine. <clears throat> this is actually like kind of easy to keep track of. If I call launch once, uh, things are pretty happy. It's not too hard. I'm probably not going to leak work. But again, you can have lots of coroutines. For example, uh, I can make a function called load lots that tries to repeat a thousand times, and each of those times launch a new coroutine uh, to go ahead and load data. And this raises lots of questions. Like, uh, who gets to cancel this? If I start a thousand network requests and I decide I no longer need them, uh, what mechanism do I have to cancel all of this work? Uh, the next question is like, who gets exceptions? When these network requests eventually, some of them fail, you make a thousand network requests, you get 998 results and two errors. Like that's how the internet works. Uh, so who gets those exceptions? Um, and then why am I making a thousand requests? That seems very impractical on an Android device. Uh, so maybe this is an example and not a uh, suggestion for real code. In order to solve this, Colin introduces the idea of scopes. Um, so a scope, uh, uh, it's a coroutine scope. A, a scope keeps track of your coroutines. And to make that happen, uh, sorry, uh, and they can also cancel all of the coroutines that they're keeping track of. Uh, so a, uh, I can make all thousand coroutines that I just launched go into a single scope, and now I have a way to cancel those coroutines. So to make that happen, uh, this code I just showed where I called launch uh, actually doesn't compile. Uh, if I try to call launch, I'm going to get a compiler that says undefined function launch because I must provide it a scope in order to call it. Uh, so let's go ahead and start doing that. Uh, so I'm going to define a new scope, and I'm going to make a coroutine scope, uh, and I'm going to pass it dispatchers.main uh, because that's kind of my default unless I'm doing something more interesting. Uh, and then I go ahead and shorten that, because we thought that was really long to type, so we made a thing called main scope that does the exact same thing. Uh, then I'm going to go ahead and call scope.launch. Uh, and this is the only way that you can call launch and call coroutines. And by doing this, now you can think about it as the coroutine launches in a scope. And then if this is a view model, uh, for the people over here, sorry. Uh, if this is a view model, you might add an on clear function. Uh, it's something that uh, will get called when the view model is done. And you might call scope.cancel in there to clean up all of the work which is kind of what we want to be doing on Android. Uh, this is a lot of boilerplate. So coming soon, uh, there's actually going to be an extension property on the model that is in alpha, but if it stays named this on the way to stable, it'll be called viewmodelscope. Uh, and you'll just be able to say viewmodelscope.launch, and that will go ahead and start work that automatically cleans itself up when the view model is done. The key concept to putting launch on a scope is that now launch always starts a coroutine in a scope. And this kind of gives us a way to keep track of all of the coroutines that we're running and help avoid leaks. The other side of this, 
that we have to think about is we have this like guarantee that when a suspend function returns, it has completed all work. So let's go back to those load lots we had earlier, where we're trying to repeat a thousand times and launch a thousand code routines. Uh, so you might notice like this runs in a scope, right? So if I'm in a suspend function, someone somewhere, I don't know who, had to start a coroutine, and that coroutine has called me. Like there's no way that anyone is running a coroutine that's not in a scope, so I must be in a scope. Uh, so you might think you could just go ahead and call launch, and it'll just go ahead and start in the scope that you're already running. Uh, but it doesn't quite work that way. If you do that, you're going to get, again, undefined function launch. So let's see. Uh, one way to solve this uh, is I could go ahead a thousand times, I could launch in something called global scope, which is kind of this global executor service that will just kind of like start things that, you know, you can no longer keep track of ever again. Uh, and that kind of scares me uh, in many, many, many ways. Uh, so there's a couple of things going on with global scope. It's kind of like very global, um, and then simultaneously, like it's not like it's not cancelable. Uh, it's not clear what's going to happen when exceptions happen. Uh, it's kind of like this is like very leaky code, and so maybe we can come up with something better than just going ahead and like unstructuring our concurrency, concurrency completely. Uh, one thing we can notice is we have that caller's coroutine scope, and. What we want to do is be inside that coroutine scope so that we're kind of like behaving well with our caller. So we can do that by using this coroutine scope builder, which you'll notice the entire API difference between this coroutine scope and the last coroutine scope is this one has a lowercase c for maximum API clarity. <laughs> um, but so this coroutine scope right here is going to define a child scope of the caller's coroutine scope. So I still, in this function, in my text of this function, I still don't know anything about this scope. Uh, but now I've created a coroutine scope that is correctly wired up with my caller's coroutine scope. And then I can go ahead and call launch, and that's going to go ahead and launch 1,000 times, which I did not animate on 1,000. Uh, but it's going to go ahead and launch 1,000 coroutines, and all of those coroutines are going to end up in this child coroutine scope that I just created. Now, this is kind of interesting, uh, because all I'm doing now here is I'm calling launch. I'm never joining this work explicitly in my code anymore. Um, but I am defining a new child coroutine scope. So what happens is, uh, as these jobs complete, so I'm going to finish this launch, finish that launch, then we'll finish all of the rest of the launches, and then that launch. This coroutine scope is still active while there's any jobs that are uh, running. And then eventually, the last job will terminate in this coroutine scope. And the coroutine scope itself will finally complete. So the kind of key concept right here is that this coroutine scope will only resume after all of its children are complete. Uh, so it's going to go ahead and hold on, and it's going to like keep this coroutine from moving past this function until all of the work that this function has created has been completed. And this gives us that guarantee that when a suspend function returns, all of its work is completed. Now, this all sounds nice, and it sounds safe. It sounds like we're not going to have any leaks, uh, which is awesome. I love safe code. That's great. Uh, but there's times on Android, and specifically on Android, where what we want is unstructured concurrency. Um, and this is, if you want to know what unstructured concurrency is, it is all of the concurrency you wrote until August of last year. Uh, so unstructured concurrency is, uh, is when I want some work to happen after my caller is done. Uh, when maybe my caller has canceled their coroutine scope, but I really wanted to continue the thing I was doing. Um, so one of the, kind of the classic example of this is I have maybe a profile edit screen in my application. And I want to go ahead and save that in the background after the user leaves the screen. Um, this is like a pretty typical UI pattern. Um, and if I put that in my view model, uh, this is going to be kind of hard to implement, right? The view model goes away, calls on clear, my save gets canceled, right? That's not going to work for me on Android. And this is a very android -y problem. Backend well, coroutine developers don't have this problem. Uh, so as you kind of like go down this, one of the key things you'll find is that as you add more scopes that are unrelated to each other to the execution of a coroutine, you're going to multiply the complexity of the code that you have to write. Uh, so you know, if you have two scopes, things are like a little bit doable, but still kind of hard. Uh, if you have three scopes, I don't know. Um, and if you have four scopes, just give up. Like it's like things get complicated. Uh, 
Um, so like really be, like hesitate away from introducing lots of unrelated scopes that interact with each other, unless you just want to like throw structured concurrency away and just have unstructured concurrency. Uh, so in order to kind of like uh, understand the exact problem we're trying to solve, let's like dive in all the way to like what structured concurrency gives us. Uh, so the first thing it gives us is that when a suspend function returns, all of its work has completed. Right? So this is not super controversial. Um, it's usually very helpful. It makes it very easy to reason about our code. They work kind of the exact same way functions do. Uh, the next thing that it gives us is that when a scope is canceled, all of its children are canceled as well. And then the third thing it gives you is that when a coroutine errors, the scope will be notified. And this one's also not controversial. It's, it's really nice for someone to get notified when there's an exception. Um, it is possible with coroutines to throw an exception and no one ever hears about it. Um, and that's not great. We don't want that. We want this to make it like crash analytics or, or to our logs or something, somewhere. Um, so structured concurrency gives us these three guarantees. And the first one and the third one aren't super things that we're trying to work around all the time. But the middle one is something that on Android does become a problem somewhat often, uh, where when a scope is canceled, our children cancel. What we really want is when a scope gets canceled, our children run. But what we didn't want is that when a scope gets canceled, our children run forever. Um, so, no, most of the time, maybe, I don't know. Uh, if you have ideas on when you want forever, let me know. But when we want to start running children and we don't want them to run forever, uh, we have, again, a whole bunch of questions. And now these questions aren't ones that Cotton solves for us. These are questions we have to do with our own code. Uh, how are we going to avoid leaks of this? Uh, if we expose a function that calls some unstructured concurrency, uh, it might get called multiple times. What happens if it gets called 10 times? Is that a problem? Uh, how can this work be canceled? Should it ever be canceled? Or does it, is it okay to let that run forever? Or who gets exceptions? Um, so these are all things that you kind of have to like reason about and think about and, and write explicit code for. Like going back to Nguyen's talk earlier, like Colin sometimes makes things we were taking for granted before very, very explicit. Uh, so if you're using like an executor service to launch some background work, uh, yeah, like the default thread exception handler is going to get called, which is nice, but these other two things, like, I don't know, you're just going to leak work all the time if, if you don't try to work. Um, so what I want to do is like walk through, uh, we're going to go off the deep end here. Uh, we're going to like look at what some unstructured concurrency code might look like. Uh, so what I want to solve is kind of that background save that we did or we talked about earlier. Um, I have this user profile. And I want to safely, in an unstructured way, run this work past the duration of the scope that called me. Uh, so in order to do that, I'm going to go ahead and define a, a new scope. And this is kind of like universal to making unstructured concurrency happen. And then in that scope, I'm going to make an unstructured coroutine. Right? I'm going to use async filter this time, which is just like launched before, but now it returns a result. Um, and this unstructured coroutine is operating separately than the coroutine that called me and doesn't, at this point in time, communicate at all between this coroutine and the other coroutine. These, these are just unrelated coroutines at this point. So in order to kind of like bridge between these two things, um, I can go ahead and inform my caller of the work by, in the coroutine that called me, calling deferred.await, uh, for those of you who, who can't see the screen right here. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and await the result of that unstructured coroutine. So it's going to go ahead and run over in this other scope, but I'm going to get the result in this scope. And I call this pattern the curious async await pattern, um, because it's like a very strange pattern, uh, but it comes up all the time when you start unstructuring coroutines, uh, unstructuring concurrency. Uh, so basically what it's doing is launching an unstructured coroutine in another scope, and then passing the result and the exceptions to the scope that called that suspend function. Then I need to go ahead and come up with some way to ensure completion, or decide that it's OK and never completes. Um, the easiest way to do that uh, is to just go ahead and give it a nice, generous timeout. Uh, and then I need to start thinking about concurrency. Um, so I'm, I'm doing this background save operation. Uh, is it okay if 10 of these run at the same time, or do I want these to run one at a time? So these are all considerations I want to start thinking about when I get into unstructured concurrency. And then finally, and this is the real point here, I have one line of code that I actually wrote, uh, which is I'm going to actually post that result up to my server. So everything else I just showed you there was just artisanal bespoke concurrency. <laughs> Which is like not great. 
So artisanal and bespoke currency. Artisanal and bespoke are great adjectives to apply to bread, um, but it's kind of scary when you apply them to concurrency. Uh, it's it's going to be difficult if I start writing code like this all throughout my code base to get it right every time. I'm probably not, um, and I you know I'm kind of comfortable with some of these patterns. Um, and more to the point, like most people aren't going to figure out why I wrote the code that way. It's it's very opaque, very dense code with like 20 lines of setup in order to call one function. Um, so that's like that's not like a great coding practice. So what the kind of big takeaway here is like the Kotlin X coroutines libraries give us low level concurrency primitives. But when we start solving repeatable problems, it's much better to go ahead and wrap up all that stuff I just showed you into a nice primitive. Um, to go ahead and put that into something like unstructured do save that I can now call this from my repository and get that save to happen in like a nice, clean, easy to read way. That like when you hire the next intern, they're going to be able to figure out what this line of code does versus the twenty lines I showed before. Um, the other thing that's really cool about this is we very much isolated the testability. Uh, we can test that do save thing in isolation, and over here we just test that we call it. Um, so things just get a little bit easier if you don't kind of like just like let that artisanal bespoke concurrency like litter your code base, like wrap that stuff up in abstractions. So going into the future of coroutines, uh, right now, today, most popular languages have coroutines already, and new languages have coroutines by default. Uh, so like I think it's pretty safe to say they're probably not a bad. Uh, they're going to, uh, I just saw a new language come out like a, two weeks ago uh, that had almost an exact implementation of Kotlin's coroutines. Like they're just kind of like the default thing languages have nowadays. And the reason for that is because coroutines are an actual way of expressing asynchronous I.O. The other thing that's going on is Kotlin introduced structured concurrency and we all have to decide whether that was a good idea. Uh, so I went through a lot of like slides today to talk about what structured concurrency is and how to like work around it sometimes. Uh, and so like, maybe structured concurrency is going to be like awesome, and 10 years from now, every language is going to copy it. Uh, maybe 10 years from now, we're all going to think that was a lot like, um, you know, checked exceptions, and maybe, uh, I don't know. So we'll have to decide that as together. Uh, the other thing that's going on with coroutines is the testing story uh, is, I was hoping it was going to launch right before my talk, but I think it's going to launch tonight. Uh, so the testing story is something that we're working on uh, to get that wrapped up to get, uh, today. Uh, so we have... This is spend function foo that calls delay 1000. Um, and I want to call that in the test. I typically don't want to actually wait a second. Uh, so what I can use is this new builder that we just merged into Kotlin X Coroutine's test like last Sunday uh, that goes ahead and gives us virtual time. It allows us to like kind of control the clock um, and fast forward it through that 1000 second delay. It also does a whole bunch of other things, but the key result is makes test go fast. Uh, so that's, that's the thing you definitely want the other thing that's going on with coroutines going forward in the future, um, I've given this talk a couple of times. Um, and I used to get asked every single time, what about RxJava? Uh, and uh, what about RxJava? Uh, and it's kind of like this interesting question. They solve, honestly, very, very different problems. Coroutines give us suspend and resume. RxJava gives us lazy streams. They're, they're different use cases for different problems. Uh, and I used to say that by the end of this year, someone's going to write Rx coroutines, which is RxJava implemented with coroutines. And the code will probably even be shorter than RxJava. And it turns out, uh, that answer was about a month ago. Uh, turns out, actually, someone did do that. And now the uh, Kotlin Xproteins library has a flow uh, class, uh, which implements a lot of the APIs, uh, kind of the core APIs from the Rx Java streaming API. Um, not nearly as expressive. It doesn't have nearly as many operators. Um, go check it out. It's pretty cool. I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. And I'm over time already. But if you take one thing away from this talk, it is that Android loves coroutines because it gives us the ability to simplify our code. Thank you.